My name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. I also run the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. I've, have, has anyone listened to the podcast or watched the YouTube channel? Awesome. Great. Yeah, that's kind of been my focus lately. I'm releasing new podcast episodes every day, new YouTube videos every day, the blog I've been doing for over 10 years now, trying to cover every aspect of LSAT preparation under the sun, games, reasoning, reading comp, study schedules, test day prep, admissions, things of that nature. Uh, one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately is the fact that the LSAT is going digital this summer. When are you all planning on taking it? Anyone taking June? Nice. Okay, July? All right, a couple of Julys and then September? Beyond September? Okay, so are all of you familiar with the things that are happening this summer? You want me to give a brief rundown? Cool. Well, I'll, I'll just quickly run through it. June's the last paper and pencil administration. Then starting in July, half of test takers will get the digital format, half will get the paper and pencil format. LSAC chooses for you, and you don't get any advance notice. So just something to be aware of. You want to prep like it's going to be paper or it's going to be digital. Be ready for anything. The LSAT will also be administered on a tablet. So you want to have a tablet, ideally, maybe not necessarily a Microsoft Surface Go, which is what the LSAT, digital LSAT will be. It could be an iPad, it could be a Samsung doesn't really matter, but you want something interactive. Now, the LSAT has, has always been the case. I gave you these logic games to work on right now. You're able to write freehand on the page as much as you like on the paper version. On the digital format, you're not going to be able to do that, though. You cannot draw freehand on the tablet the way you'd be able to on a piece of paper. You can highlight with their tool. You can underline with their tool. You can enlarge the text. You can decrease the size of the text but you can't draw on the text itself. So instead, you're going to have scrap paper to the side. So what you see right now, that's the Juno 7 LSAT. That's back when Logic Games were only one page. Starting with exam 66, Logic Games switched to a two-page layout. That's starting in June 2012. And then beyond that, it's always been a two-page layout. But again, starting this July and then September, it'll be totally digital. So you won't have any real kind of space constraint. They'll give you a booklet with scrap paper, maybe eight or 10 pages or more. And that's awesome, but it is separately. You kind of have to go back and forth between your scrap paper and the exam questions themselves. So I thought it might be useful if I just walked through a little bit of what that might look like for you, what your ideal layout might be. So maybe you want to have the rules over here your main diagram over here. And then you could have something like question one. And then like you'll see you eliminate particular choices, questions, and you draw your diagram. Then question two, you have your choices. And you eliminate just the same and so on. Then you have question three, question four, etc. And the idea is that you want to Always save your previous work. Always have your previous work available to you. It proves enormously useful when you're going through a game. And you'll see that with this game that we have on the agenda for tonight. I'll be doing question four, and I'll refer back to the work I was doing in questions one, two, and three. But you want to have a system for how you lay out your diagrams because it needs to be easily comprehensible to you, easily understandable to you, when you're going back to things later. You don't want to be reinventing the wheel and looking for where's the work from question number seven? Is it on the bottom right? Is it on the upper left? Just have a consistent layout, rules, main diagram, questions. If you want to flip these, of course, it's kind of arbitrary, but the idea is that you always do it the exact same way. And if you were to look back at your notes and diagrams one month from now, three months from now, they would still look the same and still be understandable to you. So you want to have a consistent, methodical approach with your games and how you lay them out. And so I always used to say, do your work on the page, do it next to the particular question. Of course, I can't say that anymore. So any recommendation I used to give about games in terms of diagramming is now out the window in terms of how you might lay it out because we have this new regime to be thinking about, this new style that we have to work with. And so obviously there aren't that many practice problems available for the digital LSAT. You have prep test 73 which is the September 2014 LSAT. You have that on LSAC's website at familiar.lsac.org. So I highly recommend going on there, playing around with it a bit, 
And the good news is that that's not the only one available. Next week, on April 30th, LSAC announced they're going to release two more digital LSAT practice tests. So right now, what you have freely available is the Juno 7 LSAT PDF, which I gave you one of the logic games to work on today. Then there's the prep test 73, September 2014. Then they'll be releasing two more next week. I don't know which exams they're going to be. They haven't disclosed that yet. I asked them on Twitter. They didn't write back. But be on the lookout for that. And then those of you taking in the fall, there will be a handful more released in the lead up to the fall. So keep an eye out for those. If you want more practice material, of course, there are the books of actual LSAT prep tests on Amazon for in books of 10 for about $20 each. But unfortunately, of course, those are paper and pencil format, not digital. So if you have access to the PDFs, I highly recommend using the PDFs and actually not printing them out, doing them on the screen and getting used to writing your work and the scrap paper on the side, which is, of course, the opposite of what I used to recommend. But this is the new way things are going to be moving forward. So just, again, keep that in mind. Most people typically want to do logic games in the order given, do question one, two, three, and so on. But that isn't always the order that makes the most sense for you. Sometimes it makes sense to do the orientation question first, then do all the local que if questions, then go back later to the general global questions. So you don't always have to do them in the order given as they lay them out for you here. Now for this particular game, it's actually a little bit unique in that there is no general orientation question for this game. They jump right in with an if question, then question three is also if, the other three are all general in nature. And so if you were totally lost on this game, I might suggest do questions one and three first, then go back and do questions two, four, and five. That is a viable, valid strategy to consider. I think for this game, it isn't totally necessary, but for other games, it might be useful. So just keep that in mind. You don't always have to do the games in the order given, even within the particular questions. As for the set of four games overall within a section, I think generally you want to do all four games in the order given. If you're aiming for a 160 or 165 plus, I think it's worthwhile, of course, to attempt all four games and just run through them all. There's no sense in sit looking at game three and saying, oh, that's kind of hard. I'll skip it and come back to it later because you've already invested yourself a bit up front in reading that game. And then you have to dive back into it later. So kind of you have to kind of play around with things and see what works for you. But generally, I do the four games in the order given, but the questions within a game I might consider jumping around a little bit. Now, I saw some of you who arrived early got a chance to work through the game a bit. I see some of you even completed the game, which is awesome. So how did you find it? Um, was it easy? Difficult? Not too bad, right? That's good to hear. And what, you were able to solve it? Awesome, great. So you were able to run through it. So maybe my work is done for tonight, but I'll run through it anyway, just in the event that some of you might find it useful. So this game is kind of weird because it obviously involves numbers as the variables. That's incredibly unusual. Virtually, I think every single other logic game ever released that I can think of has always involved letters for variables. They might have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or they might have X, Y, Z, things like that. I actually wrote my own logic game where I made almost all the variables start with the letter A. So if you want to get a taste of how tricky things can get, go on my website. It's the basic linear logic game difficult version. I use the names of Greek gods, so like Ares, Aphrodite, Apollo, Athena, then Dionysus and Demeter. So I like five A's and two D's. It's, it's really tricky. The trick I think that I used was just kind of I do A, A, T, H for Athena, A, P, H for Aphrodite and so on. So there are ways to deal with that, but of course it's not ideal. And people said, well, that's not realistic. And I'd say, well, putting five variables that are numbers is also not expected. It's unusual. So here, our variables are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's like our A, B, C, D, E. Not ideal, of course, but we can work with it. Now, we have these five digits. They're creating a series of five-digit product codes. And we have the first digit, second digit, third digit, and so on. So there is actually an ordering component to this game. This is the first digit, second, third, fourth, fifth. And then we're going to be placing on top of this maybe something like this. Now, obviously, this is not something we really love seeing. It can get very confusing with the numbering and the variables. Maybe not so, not so for you, but I don't love it. And under time pressure, when you've never seen this before, and you're under the stress of it being the real thing, 
obviously you can get flustered and make mistakes. So I'd recommend not numbering the slots themselves. Hey, come on in, take a seat. I recommend not numbering the slots. We have our five variables and we'll just place them on top. And it's not like there's 10 slots. So I don't think it's excruciatingly difficult to actually just count this is third, this is fourth and so on. So these are the five digits. Each digit occurs only once, exactly once. That's kind of a loophole closer, just preventing us from saying that maybe something repeats and then another one doesn't go at all. They tell us the second digit has a value exactly twice that of the first. So the second digit is twice that of the first digit. So if this was one, this would be two. If this were two, this would be four. If this were three, this would be six. But there is no six, so this is not gonna be three. And this is not, if this was four, that would be eight. Obviously there is no eight, so we're not getting these. Anything times zero itself is gonna be zero, right? So if this were zero, well zero times two is zero, we can't have variables repeat, so that's not gonna work either. So what you see I'm doing here is I'm considering all the possibilities, even the ridiculous ones, and then I'm eliminating them. So if it's not gonna be zero, three, or four, what's left to go on slot number one? Excellent, yeah, so one and two. So we could either have one or two. Those are our only two possibilities. If this is one, this is two. If this is two, this is four. Now, I wanna divide the two possibilities into separate diagrams so I can make more specific inferences about each. So this could be one, this is two, one times two is two, two times two is four. We've already eliminated 40% of the slots, two out of five are de fully determined. That's a pretty good starting point. Then they say the value of the third digit is less than the value of the fifth digit. So third digit is going to be a lower number than five. So the third digit then cannot be the highest possible number. Highest possible number in the top scenario is four. The third digit is lower than the fifth, so the third digit cannot be number four. In this possibility, the lower one, obviously four is already taken, and th third slot has to be lower than five, so third slot can't be what? Excellent, awesome, third slot cannot be three. So if this is not four, and one and two are already taken, what's left to potentially go here? Yeah, sure, so if we've already placed one and two, and four can't be on slot three, what's left to go here? What potentially remains? Excellent, yeah, zero and three. So it's gonna be either zero or three here. And then what about this slot? If it can't be two, four, or three, what's left? Sorry? One or zero. One or zero, exactly, thanks. So it's gonna be one or zero. Or maybe if you want to just put things in numerical order, we'll say zero and one, just to be consistent. Now, we said the third slot is lower than the fifth. So the fifth slot has to be higher than the third slot. So we already have, we, the third slot, the fifth slot cannot be the lowest possible variable, meaning that it can't be what here? Zero. Excellent. This can't be zero, and this can't be what? Yeah, zero again, excellent, because zero is kind of, it's not placed here at all. So this can't be zero, this can't be zero. It has to be a relatively higher number. Four is already taken, so it's gonna be either three or one. And then over here, can't be zero, it's gonna be either four or three. So we've determined almost everything here. Obviously the fourth slot is totally open-ended and ambiguous, but this is still a pretty good jumping off point before going into the game. So that's it for the setup. Any questions on the setup? Hi, come on in. Sorry. It's all right, yeah, take a seat. So this is the technique that's often called making templates or frames or worlds, essentially multiple possibilities. Every single valid scenario will fall within one of these two possibilities. Those are the only valid possibilities for the game. So at this point I'd say we're good to go ahead and jump into the questions themselves. So like I said, there's typically an orientation question which kind of gives you a list of valid possibilities. Here, we don't have that at all. They jump right in with a local question, so I would just go ahead and do a local question here. So number one, if the last digit of an acceptable product code is one, then it must be true that. So 
there's obviously nothing with one over here. We're going to be down here. So we are within this second possibility specifically where we have two, four, zero, blank, one. Now, obviously, we can infer what's going to be remaining there. It's going to be number three. So we actually fully determined every, the, down to the very exact specific possibility for this game. It, for this question, 24031, then all we've got to do is scan through the choices and see what fits. So first digit is two. Bingo. We're good. That's it. I'll run through the others, though. Second is zero. No. Third is three. No. Fourth is four. No. Fourth is zero. No. So that's it. We fully determined it from the outset, and we're good on number one. Number two, what must be true about any acceptable product code? For this one, I typically, when I were, if I were doing a game, I wouldn't love to do this question right now because we've only done one scenario so far. But we also have these two major possibilities. So between all three of these that we've laid out, and of course, these first two actually contain many more within them. They contain every single one. This alone could be enough. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into this one right now. But if you wanted to skip it and come back to it later, that would be perfectly fine too. So must we always have one appearing before two? We've got it here, but we don't have it here. One's appearing after two. And here also, one's appearing after two. So for that reason, A is not valid. We can eliminate A. Looking at B, digit 1 is appearing before digit 3. Must that always happen? Well, we've got 1 before 3 here. We could have 1 before 3 here, but perhaps not necessarily. And here we have 3 before 1. So it is possible to have 3 before 1, meaning that 1 does not always appear before 3. And so B is eliminated as well. Moving on to C, 2 appears before 3. Must that happen? We've got 2 before 3 here. We've got 2 first here. And even in this scenario, 2 is only after 1. Everything else is coming later than 2. So it does appear that 2 is always before 3, no matter what, in any valid scenario. So C is our answer for number 2. I'll just run through D and E as well to be thorough. 3 before 0, must that always happen? Here, there's a lot of ambiguity about them. Here, lots of ambiguity as well. In fact, 0 will likely appear before 3 in this bottom scenario. And we also have it occurring here as well. So D is out. And then E, 4 before 3, happens here. But here, 4 could be last. So E is out as well. The answer was C. Moving on to 3. If the third digit is not 0, so we're obviously not using our work from number 1 here, but we could use each of these as a jumping off point. So I'll go over here just to write these out a little more. Third digit is not 0. That means we're going to have 3 and 1 within each of our two possibilities. Now they said that the third is always less than the fifth, right? So if this is the third and this is the fifth, we know that four is going to go here. If this is the third, this is the fifth. This can't be zero. It's going to have to be three. Then we have zero going in each of these. So if those are our possibilities, then they're just saying what in general must be true. Is the second digit two? Not necessarily. Is the third digit three? Once again, not necessarily. Fourth digit zero? occurs in both, so we're good. And that's our answer. I'll run through the others. Fifth is three, not always. Fifth is one, again, not always. So that takes care of three. Now on to number four. This is my favorite question of the game because it actually involves a lot of previous work. They're asking, what could be the pairs of the third and fourth digits respectively except? So four of these choices are valid and could occur and perhaps did occur in previous valid scenarios. And we do, in fact, find that. We have here 0 and 3. So we can eliminate right off the bat choice B from this question, because we have seen 0 and 3 be on slots 3 and 4, respectively. Then up here, we have 3, 0, and 1, 0. 
So that eliminates choice D and choice C from this question as well. So just from previous work alone, we're down to A and E. We eliminate three out of five of these. And then if we actually look at what is remaining with 0, 1 on 3, 4, or 3, 4, just filling in here to see if we can test out each of these, what happens. So we already saw, bam, 3 can't go there in that possibility. It would have to be up here. So we would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 0. But then 3 is not less than 5. Not valid. The third digit's not less than the fifth digit, so that's out. 3, 4 is not going to work, so that's our answer. Okay, and finally, number 5. What must be true in general about any valid acceptable product code? Again, we can look back at previous valid scenarios and such. Must there always be one digit between 0 and 1? Exactly one digit in between the two. We have that here. We have 2 between them here. And we have 0 between them here. In that one, they are adjacent. So we don't always have exactly one digit in between them, so A is out. Looking at B, exactly one digit between digit 1 and digit 2? No, here they are adjacent. So that's out also. Looking at C, at most two digits between 1 and 3, which essentially means that we couldn't have them on the two endpoints. Remember, so if there are at most two between them, that would be saying that we have max like this, 1 space space 3. It couldn't ever be 1 space 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 3. It couldn't ever be 3 space 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 1. They're saying that could never happen. Could it happen? Have we seen it happen? It could happen here, 1 and 3 on slots 1 and 5. That could happen. They could be on total opposite ends. It could be 1, 2, 0, 4, 3. That would be a perfectly fine, valid scenario. So C is out as well. It is not a must. Then if we go on to D, at most two digits between 2 and 3, or could they once again be on the endpoints? We have them here on the endpoints. It is possible for them to be, to, for them to have three digits in between them. So D is out. We get E by elimination. And then looking at E, at most two digits between two and four. Or, once again, could we have two and four on the endpoints? Well, we see right here, two is in slot two if we're going to have four on the end. Otherwise, two and four are adjacent. So you could never have two and four on the endpoints just looking at the outset from the very beginning of the game, our initial setup. So that's the game. Any questions on this game? Awesome. Well, you guys, you guys rocked it. I saw that even from the beginning, you were able to tackle it at the outset. Now, I do have another game in mind for us to run through. I didn't give you this game. That's because of LSAC copyright stuff. But you probably have it or have access to it somewhere. It's a classic game used for instruction. It's Prep Test 33, game number two. It's the classic Birds in the Forest game. This game really tests conditionality in and out. It's an older game. It's from December 2000, but it's a classic, and they've repeated it many, many times over the years. Anyone watch Legally Blonde here? Yeah, so you know that the CDs game that they referenced at one point with like the used and new, jazz, opera, pop, rap, and soul? So that game is like a harder version of this Birds in the Forest game. But this game it was in Test 31. It was Test 45 with the Photographs game, Test 58 with the Volunteers. It's come up again and again and again over time. And so this is a classic that I think is really valuable to, valuable to use for illustrative purposes here to deal with conditionality, contrapositives, and linking conditional statements together. So if you're, any of you are using any textbooks like the Logic Games Bible, they have it as an example in there, and so you may have access to it in some way. But again, Prep Test 33, Logic Game number 2, Birds in the Forest. The variables are G, H, J, M, S, W. And I have the rules written here just so I can walk through creating the main diagram and linking things together. And then you can go home and try the game on your own if you like. So these are the variables. We have them. There are six birds. And some are in the forest. Some are not. So we're selecting. We're choosing. Some are in. Some are out. 
That's what makes this an in-out or grouping conditional game. The first rule tells us if harriers are in, then grosbeaks are not. That's the first rule of the game. Now, people will typically take all the conditional rules and their contrapositives and later try to link everything together. This becomes really messy, so I recommend avoiding it. It's much more efficient to link things together as you go step by step. So first, h arrow not g, contrapositive g arrow not h. But I'm not going to keep taking each rule and doing this again and again. I'm going to build them onto what I already have here. So the next rule says j, m, or both are in. If j, m, or both are in, then h will also be in. Now, we already have h here. So we can simply take j and m and stick them onto the front of this. If j or m is in, then h is in. Now, the rule says if j, m, or both is in, then h. So you might ask, well, what do we do about the, the or both? And my answer is the or both is redundant. You don't need to worry about it because in logic, the word or already includes the possibility of both. So this is all you have to do. You don't even have to write the word or here because j alone is sufficient to require h and m alone is also sufficient to require h. So you could just leave it like this. But then we have to think to ourselves, well, what about the contrapositive? People get a little confused here. And my recommendation is just treat them separately. J requires H also. M happens to require H. Once you have that, you could say, well, J requires H. Anybody at the contrapositive? What would be the contrapositive of this statement alone? Perfect. Not H, then not J. We have not H here. We can stick a not J on after it. And then M requires H, same thing. Not H requires not M. So we tack that on to the bottom here. I wouldn't actually write that part down on the side. That's just for illustrative purposes now. On test day, I want you to be proficient enough in the contrapositive where you can link it on right here. And you'll see these are kind of mirror images of each other. J is positive at the beginning here. It becomes negative at the end there. M is positive at the beginning here. It's negative at the end there. G is negative at the end here. Becomes positive at the beginning here. So. That's pretty much the layout of the first two rules. You see they link together pretty nicely. Now the third rule says W requires G. We've got G right here. We can simply stick a W on in front of that. It kind of feels weird to build onto the beginning of something, but logically it's no different than tacking onto the end of it. So we have W requires G, contrapositive not G requires not W. So we're starting to build some major inferences here. We can see that at a glance now, W indirectly requires not M, and J indirectly requires not W. The fact that these are not adjacent, that they are spaced apart with other things in between, has no bearing on the logic. But LSAC will reward us for having made these connections, because it is kind of impressive to be able to do this, not to do my own horn here, but from LSAC's perspective, making these chains requires taking contrapositives and linking things together, and that's what they're looking for you to do on games, at least in this kind of game. Now the final rule says not j requires s. We have not j here. We stick s onto the end of it. Contrapositive of this, so that's not j requires s. We flip the order, so s becomes, at, it was at the end, now it's at the beginning. It was positive there, now it's negative. J was negative, now it's positive. We have J, positive J here, positive J up there. We stick a negative S on to the front of that. And again, just doing that for illustration. So now you see it got even longer. It got even a little more complicated, but that's just the nature of the game. Now we can see that W indirectly requires S, and of course, not S requires not W. So it's a lot, but this is the game. If you have these two diagrams, you've pretty much got the game made. It's pretty much wrapped up in a bag. But there are a couple of confusing things about a game like this that I think are worth talking about. 
One of them is that we have positive variables followed by negative variables, and we also have negative variables followed by positive variables. And these are very different things. A positive followed by a negative means at least one of the two will always be out. They conflict. So you can never have both H and G in at the same time. That might seem kind of obvious, and this is the easier part. There's a harder part coming. But if we have H requires not G, that means at least one out maybe both will be out. You cannot have both in. I know this is all really obvious, but it gets harder when we look at the other kind. So the example of this is H and G. That, so my, my real world example for this is if you have cookies, then you can't have donuts. It's intuitive that you can't have too many desserts or you'll get sick or something like that. At least that's what they tell me. So that's one type of relationship. Now, the other type of relationship that is more confusing is when you have a negative followed by a positive. So that is our not J, then S. And of course, there are, there are more examples than just that. Not H, then S is also a negative arrow positive. But this means something very different. This means at least one in. So you can never lack both. You must always have at least one of the two. And maybe you could have both in. That's the weirdest part of this, is that you see a negative and a positive side by side. People will often assume that means that there is a conflict. But there is not a conflict here. There is nothing stopping you from having both. If I told you, if S, what else must be true, there is nothing at all that we can infer about this. Nothing else logically follows. It's totally open-ended. So there, it is in fact possible to have all of, let's say, M, H, J, S. Those four could all be in. Nothing at all prevents that. Obviously, there are conflicts with G and W about that, but these four together is perfectly fine. There's actually a question related to that. So the only big takeaway from this one is that you cannot lack both. And my example for this is that if you don't eat your peas, then you must eat your carrots. So if you don't have one vegetable, then you must have the other, but no one's going to stop you from eating lots of vegetables, right? So those are the two kinds of relationships you really want to be on the lookout for in this kind of game. And they've tested this again and again and again over the years. If you want more examples, again, test 31, game two, test 45, game three, and test 58 game two. Maybe I'll write this, that down for all of you. Yeah. So those are, and there's also actually one more, test 36, game one. So it's happened again and again and again over time. I have a list on my website of seven logic games that repeated, and this is the first category. And I actually wrote my own logic game that is in the same style. It's not a carbon copy, it has its own logic to it, but my own logic game I also, where people vote for and against uh, bills, political bills. And this is, an this is an example of that with lots of conditional chains. Has anybody done this game before? How do you find it? Yeah, you, you get used to it. That's the thing. I think the repetition is, is really important because obviously seeing things like this for the first time, it's going to take a long time. You're not going to do it in 8 minutes and 45 seconds at the outset. But if you've done 5 of them or 6 of them, then when you see a new one on test day, you could breeze through the whole game in maybe 6 minutes ideally and then have a time bank built up to do tougher games later. So that's pretty much, I think this is one of the most valuable games to, to learn overall on the LSAT period. There's obviously ordering, there's grouping, there's combinations, there's relative ordering, but I think that this kind of conditional logic, the contrapositive and chaining things together, it's a concept that comes up not only in games, but also in logical reasoning a little bit too. So you really do get a big return on your time investment for learning this. Any questions on this game? What about on games in general? 
Yeah. How long do you usually, like, when do you know to stop doing setting your initial That's a great question. Yeah, that's kind of a classic question with logic games. I think there's not a super hard and fast rule on that. It's really when you run out of steam and you're not making further headway as you do more and more and more investments. You look and you, if you see like multiple, multiple rules involving the same exact variable, like here we had G in the first rule and then also in the third rule. We had H in the first rule and then again in the second rule. So when you see the same variables in multiple rules, that suggests you'll be able to link them together. So you try to link them, and if you can, great. If there are not multiple rules containing the same variables, then maybe there is not as much you can do up front. So I think the answer really is if you're kind of getting stuck in quicksand and you're investing second after second, minute after minute, and you're not making any further progress, that's a sign to step away and just kind of move on to the questions at that point. And I suppose one thing I should comment on is the recent weird curveball games you see in more recent exams those types of games, there is not as much you can do up front with this setup. You might have only two rules or three rules and they don't relate at all. And then you kind of have to hold these more general principles in your head as you go through the game drawing, drawing more local diagrams. So if there is a game where you don't see as much upfront work possible, don't panic. It's probably not you. It could just be the game itself. If you're doing games from, let's say, prep tests in the 30s and 40s, those games had a lot of upfront inferences possible. But then looking into the 70s and 80s, it's become a little bit less common. The LSAT is a kind of evolving and adapting over time. And as a result, it becomes less vulnerable to tricks and techniques and things like that. You kind of have to absorb the games for, for yourself and adapt it to your own personal strategy, not just kind of blindly copying what someone else teaches you. If you watch a lot of explanations online or read books of explanations, they're useful, but only up to a point. You can't just copy what you see some other person's like perfect way of doing it. Like even my way, this is one way, but I obviously did not invent this the first time I did the logic game, right? It took me a long, long time to develop these sorts of techniques. And so I think that you kind of have to make it your own just through doing lots and lots of them. So even just doing one book of 10 exams, that's 40 games, that's great. And you should certainly do and redo those. But even that alone, I think isn't going to be enough. You might want to do 30 exams worth of games or 40 exams worth of games, which leads you to do obviously hundreds of games, but it takes that long to start to see the patterns between them. Because even one set of 40 games, one set of 10 exams, you might only see a couple of games that are similar to each other. And so it's, that's why it's really important to do games by type. So in my study plans, I have you doing ordering games, then grouping games, then combination games. But even specifically within that, I'll have you do easy ordering, then moderate ordering, then difficult ordering, then easy grouping, moderate grouping, difficult grouping. And I have the vast majority of logic games ever released categorized in this way so you can work through them systematically, not just doing exams 72 to 81 in order, rather doing the, all the ordering games from that set than all the grouping games from that set, but really dividing up specifically from easy to hard within each category so that at least you're doing like all of these in a row, you'll see the patterns. Or if you're doing, let's say, those tricky rule substitution or equivalent questions, you want to do a bunch of those in a row as well. Those started, I think, in exam 57, and they've appeared pretty consistently up till 86. And that, those are the questions, for those not familiar, they ask you which one of the following, if true, would be a valid substitution for a pre-existing rule in the game. Those are really tricky. They come up maybe once every exam, but if you're doing them only one out of 23 questions, you won't develop a rhythm for how to solve them efficiently. But if instead you did all the equivalent rule questions in a row, you would then be more likely to see the patterns and improve your understanding as a result. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, sure. Kind of like change the rule of the game and put in more like hypotheticals that then always throw me off. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So there's two variations on this. One is, of course, the typical just general if local question where they're further restricting the possibilities. When you have that, the ideal is to just draw a new hypothetical, draw a new scenario, incorporate... No, you're going to use the rules also. You're going to use the rules plus the if limitation. So if they say something like... If they say like, if x is third, comma, then what must be true? 
you put x on 3, and then you take your other rules, maybe the other rule says something like, the fourth slot cannot be either a or b. So if the fourth slot can't be a or b, and it's obviously not x, what does that leave? It might leave something like c, d, or y, let's say. So you take the x plus the previous rule, and you combine it to make an inference. So that's, that's I think, what most typically happens with new restrictions, new possibilities. The, exactly, apply it and combine it with the rule. Then the more rare limitation you see is when they maybe add a new rule to the constraints of the game, or they subtract a rule from the constraints of the game. This has kind of fallen out of favor with LSAC in favor of the rule substitution questions, but since that Birds in the Forest game from Test 33 is a little bit on the older side, you'll actually see the final question of that game has a rule addition question where they add a new constraint to the game overall. And so you then take that new constraint and combine it with your main diagram to derive new inferences. And then on the flip side, Test 36 Game 1, they did a rule subtraction question as the final question of the game, where they remove a constraint, which of, of course again changes the possibilities. So your previous main diagram is no longer fully valid because you have to consider the new constraint they've added or subtracted as well. And of course that could affect any inferences you may have derived at the outset. So you just have to consider that as well. But those aren't coming up as much anymore now. You just have the rule substitution questions again from exam 57 all the way up to present appearing almost every single exam. So that's about 30 questions to practice on. So there's plenty of opportunity to get better at those. Yeah, question? Yeah, totally. So 845, of course, is your average. 845 times 4 is your 35 minutes, which is your typical constraint unless you have accommodations for extra time. So 845 is only an average. I would never recommend timing yourself to that constraint for any particular game in isolation. Instead, I would suggest you do the games as a set of four, as a time section, and you could kind of benchmark where you're at. So maybe game one took you 10 minutes, game two took you seven minutes, game three took you another 10 minutes, and so on. And you're just aware of it, and then you can look to reduce it. But I wouldn't overly stress about timing on any one particular game. The, obviously, the CD's game from Legally Blonde, that's definitely going to be a 12-minute game for most people looking at it for the first time. It's super complicated, and that's all right. The idea is maybe you get better at the easier games that came earlier in the section, and so as a result of that, you'll have built up a time bank you can apply to the tougher ones later. So how do you recommend doing that? How do you recommend minimizing the time errors that come as the two games like you have in the game? Well, I think the biggest thing is to look for the games that repeat, and so you can really solidify your understanding of the concept. So for example, these in-out games I've been talking about, that's a game type where you can get down to six minutes. It's possible. Maybe not for CDs, but for the other ones, these other four could all be six-minute games because they're identical to each other in virtually every important way. You draw your contrapositives, you draw your conditionals, you link things together, and you take it from there. But then a tougher game that maybe is a curveball or a weird one where it requires a bit more flexibility in your approach, for those, you may have to take longer, and that's fine. I guess the other thing is recognizing when you're getting bogged down, you don't have to necessarily attempt every single question. Of course, you want to attempt every single one, but if you can't get to them, if one just isn't cracking for you, you guess, you move on, hope to come back later. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but it's all right. You don't want to obviously get stuck in quicksand at the expense of getting into a tougher, uh, an easier game that may come later. Yeah? I, I read it from the book. Uh, it says uh, you may have like a vision of silver, or like a big thing, and it's a big thing. And so there's a sort of a rule um, the sufficient conditions can never occur together, but necessary conditions can occur together. So how do you um, comprehend that, and, and how do you apply that in multi games, where you not not continue? The sufficient conditions cannot occur together. Right, but the necessary conditions can occur together. Can you elaborate on that? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Um, so. So, 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 for example, A to B, 
composite B, uh, B, uh, no B to no A. Right. So A and no B could never occur together. But it's possible for B and no B uh, and B and no A to occur together. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So you could never have A and not B. That's impossible. Because A requires so because A requires positive B. Mm -hmm. So if A requires positive B, you'll never have A with negative B. Correct. But then B and negative A could occur together because B requires nothing and negative A requires nothing. B does not lead to anything and negative A does not lead to anything either. So the sufficient condition kind of adds new restrictions. The sufficient condition is, is often difficult to satisfy because it requires other things. But the necessary condition is, I think of it as being very easygoing, because the necessary condition does not require anything to come after it. So I think this just comes down to sufficient versus necessary. Sufficient always requires or guarantees other things as a result, but necessary conditions don't lead to anything in particular. They're much more open-ended. It's, that's more of a that's more of a conceptual thing, honestly. No, I mean I've never really thought about it in quite this particular way. This may be a case of a book overcomplicating something more than more than you really need to. I think it's it's an interesting exercise, and I'm glad that I was able to answer it on the fly because I haven't really ever thought about this before. But I think that honestly, it's just the distinction between necessary and sufficient, honestly. Because I was using those circles to, to represent, so a big circle and a small circle. So the small circle would be the sufficient, and the big one would be the necessary, right? Yeah, I mean, this, this already sounds really complicated to me, to be honest. Oh, all right, okay. Yeah, the, you know, circle, the circles and triangles and squares and things like that, I think they're... The small one is sufficient. So if you have sufficient, it's got to be in that big circle of necessary. That's how I visualize it. Okay, well, that could be like, for example, let's say if it's an apple, then it's a fruit, right? Right, right. So that makes sense because the necessary is the fruit, the sufficient is the apple. There are obviously many more fruits than apples. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's where they're going with it. So, the um, sufficient would be A, which is the apple, and no fruit can never occur together. No fruit will, will be everything outside of that big circle. Right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Small circle and outside of the big circle can never occur together. But then, uh, so the next condition would be B, which is um, the fruit. Right. And, and not apple can occur together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. exactly. So, you could have fruit. And things that are not, not apples, right, right, like right. bananas, pears, and so on, occurring together. Yeah, correct. All right, cool. Well, I'm glad I was able to clear that up at least. Section 3. Mm -hmm. On the late, um, cleans up kind of scenario setup, so all the questions took time to complete. Is there any way to divide that? Some of the more weirder curveball games, like I said, they require adaptation and flexibility. I think the probability or any math on the L side is actually quite limited. The thing is just getting your head around whatever it is that they're throwing at you. And the, the unfortunate thing about these weird curveball games is that they're not even that similar to each other. So you kind of just have to get used to being thrust into these sort of unfamiliar, excuse me, tricky situations. And that requires doing lots and lots of curveball games in a row. I have a list on my site. I can, if you email me, I'll send it, you the link. It's a list of just basically every curveball game from exam one up to exam 80. And it's really valuable to just do a bunch of those only after you've mastered the easier games, though. So we had a mix of folks going for the summer and then the fall, right? So I thought maybe it'd be useful if I just walk through a little bit of how to structure your study schedules in the lead up. So there's three phases of LSAT studying, in my opinion. There's accuracy. There's pacing, and there's endurance. 
So accuracy is working untimed by type. So like I said, for games, for example, that could be ordering, then grouping, then combination, specifically within each category, easy ordering, moderate ordering, difficult ordering, then on to grouping, and so on. So you do this untimed, working by type. In my study plans, I'll have you read a particular chapter in a prep book, then read the relevant articles on my site covering the theory, and then the practice involves the actual LSAT exams, working through the games by type, then doing the same for logical reasoning, then doing the same for reading comprehension. So that's all untimed. You don't want to time yourself and get discouraged when the results don't match up with what your goals are, but that's natural that they wouldn't because you're just learning the basics. The LSAT is kind of like a foreign language, and so it's normal for you to have trouble with it at first. So you just work untimed at the first. Then second phase is pacing, where you do individual timed sections of 35 minutes. Maybe you can't hit the 35 minute mark yet. Maybe it's taking you 40 or 45 or 50, whatever it is, that's fine. So let's say you're currently at 50. Maybe you want to challenge yourself a little bit and go to try to solve it in 48 minutes. And then gradually under each subsequent attempt of a time section, you reduce it by a minute or two here and there till eventually you get down to the 35 minute mark. If it just is not happening for you no matter what, and you maybe have a case for something like ADHD, then you go to a doctor, you pay them some money, they diagnose you, they give you the analysis, and maybe you get extra time. I've noticed a lot of my students getting extra time. It's become more common since LSAC got sued. The federal government, there was a big lawsuit, the Americans with Disabilities Act. LSAC has gone from being overly restrictive on giving extra time to now giving it to lots and lots of people. So I know it's problematic. I see some of you shaking your heads. I, I feel similarly, but it is what it is. So you could go from getting 35 minutes to getting 53. Perfection. Yeah or 35 to 70. So time and a half or double time. Excuse me? I, I have an appointment for <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah? All right, all right, yeah. Give it a shot, see what happens. I mean, they do give it to a lot of people and it's, it's kind of... That's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, no, do, do you have difficulty focusing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. I start and then I just like fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not no, I hear you. I mean, some people do have a valid case for it, and it's kind of always hard to tell who has a valid case, who doesn't, but let the doctors in LSAC decide, right? So you could get time and a half, you could get double time. Time and a half is easier to get, but it's obviously an enormous, and it's, it's obviously an enormous benefit. The downside is, as, as someone said, there, there's the endurance, right? You could get totally burned out 53 minutes for five sections. That really lengthens your LSAT test day, right? It goes from being three hours to longer. So what if you're done prior to the time of the No. No, it's, you're always limited within that set. Yeah, so think about it. You know, if you have, you have your 35 minute sections, if you have five of those plus a 10 minute break, that becomes close to something like three plus hours. When you consider like, excuse me? Yeah, the right, well actually, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you mentioned that. So the writing sample starting in June, you don't do it at the test center anymore, you do it at home on the computer. Yeah, super weird, right? It's never been that way before. So how is it gonna be like at home? Like are they gonna do something with a webcam? Yeah, so they're, they're gonna have you on your computer You'll have to use a computer with a webcam and a microphone. They're going to monitor you. You'll hold up your government ID to the camera oh. to show it's really you, and you, ty you type it out. And it's still a 35-minute time constraint. Obviously, maybe different if you have accommodations, but they're, watch they're not actually watching you. Like They have it, the recording in case they have to verify it for security purposes later. But that's it. You, from what I read on LSAC's site, you have up to one year after the test administration to do the writing sample. I know someone mentioned differently. Maybe I'll have to look it up just to see if they've changed their policy or something. But Correct. The topic doesn't matter, though. Yeah. Um, so I know the, the I know the exams are moving to dig, digital. I'm taking it in July, um, and I haven't heard it. Like I know, like you go on the LSAC website and they have examples and everything to see what it's going to look like. But have you heard of like um, just like tests with whether like a uh, practice test throughout the city that maybe people are administrating that aren't the digital? Like is is that I haven't heard anything. That's a great question. I wish they were. 
it's so new yeah. that I think not yet. Okay. But for those taking in the fall, I imagine that some of the big, big prep companies might start administering it in that style. I know that a lot of the big prep companies are starting to adapt all the LSAT prep tests to the digital to the digital format, but it is kind of costly for them to give everybody tablets. They have to buy like 30 tablets for everybody. It, it does add up if they're a couple hundred dollars a pop. So, so I don't know. I'd say, go, so get it, get a tablet if you don't already have one. LSAC, again, is using a Microsoft Surface Go, but you can use an iPad or a Samsung. And go on LSAC's site, familiar.lsac.org, and currently Test73 is on there. Like I said earlier, they're going to be adding two more next week. And then for the fall, they'll be adding, where they, they seem to be indicating several more, maybe a half dozen more. So you will maybe have up to six or eight or 10 going for the fall, but going for July only, you'll probably only have a couple. So what would you recommend? So I actually have one of your study guides. Oh, great. Right? So um, what would you recommend like trying to be able to do like the digital? Would it be like when you're like, so I guess like towards the end, we're in the schedule where it has me taking tests. Would I like mix both of them? Is that what? Like, That's a great question. So I, I would say, you want to do a mix of the ones on LSAC's site on your tablet. So you maybe save two or three, you do two or three of those on the tablet on your own and you have their countdown timer and everything for administering. And then for the other timed exams you do, I suggest if you can use the PDFs, do the, have the PDFs up on your screen and maybe ideally on the tablet screen and then have your scrap paper on the side and just try to time yourself and mimic it as best you can. It's obviously a bit scary for them to be, to be doing something new, but I think there are some benefits too, like bubbling. Bubbling takes two seconds on the tablet. You just click or tap with the stylus and you're good versus bubbling with the pencil, number two pencil that adds maybe a minute or two. I was on the study schedule thing. And I guess I should cover the last part. So there's pacing, which is the, which is the individual time sections working down from maybe 50 minutes or 45 minutes down to the 35 minute mark. And then finally, you have endurance, which is when you're doing full length timed exams. And those should be five sections, not four, because you want to simulate what you're actually going to be doing on test day. And even if you have a co testing accommodations, they now make you do the experimental as well. So everybody's doing five sections. Maybe the breaks vary, maybe the, the length of that you have for the section might vary, but it is still going to be five sections, three back to back typically, then a 10 minute break or so, then two more back to back. And so your first time sitting could be four sections just to kind of get your feet wet a bit, but then you do want to increase it to five sections. And so you could take exams, let's say 83, 84, 85, and 86, take those in the four weeks leading up to test day. And then to simulate the experimental, you take exam 82, divide it into four parts, and then insert each one of those four parts into exams 83, 84, 85, and 86. Then later you could tally your results for 82 to see what you might have gotten had you taken it as a separate time exam. So you really do want to simulate and of course give your full effort on the experimental. And so that means as a whole for your time sitting, don't give yourself extra breaks. Don't check your results after every single section. I know it's so tempting, but don't, you have to wait till the end. And don't, you know, if you go to the bathroom, the clock still keeps running. You only have snacks available to you that are gonna be available to you on test day. So banana, granola bar, not anything else, not anything crazy. Uh, you could even have your gallon size Ziploc with your pencils and erasers and everything just to make it as realistic as possible. Of course, the digital LSAT changes a little bit of, that, of the details on that. So you want to look at their site and make sure that whatever you're planning to bring is permitted. But I think just practice as, mu as much as you can, like it's going to be game day. So for, again, for those taking in the fall, especially using the tablet, using the PDFs, having scrap on the side. And I recommend taking at least 10 full length timed exams in the lead up to test day. So that could be on average, ideally, maybe one exam per week. That's a good general benchmark. Maybe two exams per week if you have a ton of time available to you, but I wouldn't recommend any more than that or else you could end up burning out. And you also might not have enough time to fully review everything you're doing. It is really important to properly review everything you do, whether untimed or timed. I think review is actually the most important part of the, of the exam prep process that often gets overlooked. You really want to look at for everything you get wrong and everything you have difficulty with, what is tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong, what's discouraging about the right answer that pushed you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. 
You want to do this again and again and again for everything you get wrong and everything you have difficulty with, even if you were down to two and you guessed on it and you got it right, it's still valuable to review those questions too. And for the most difficult, maybe three to five per exam, you could actually write out in a notebook by hand or on a Word document, laying out your entire detailed thought process. I have videos on my YouTube channel featuring student written explanations and they're not the most perfect explanations in the world, but people actually really grapple with what was tempting, what was discouraging, and really getting into their thought processes. It's, it's the hardest part of prep because you want to just kind of score yourself and move on, but I think grappling with the toughest problems is really where the growth comes from so you avoid making the same mistakes again and again. Other questions? Anything at all on games or else that study schedules or prep? Yeah? Do you really have a laptop? Use a laptop. You mean for your own studying? Yeah, you can. I mean, I think that it's it's better than nothing. I think if you can get, pull up the PDFs on the screen and have your scrap paper on the side, that's a decent simulation. But remember that on testing, you're going to have a stylus. You will have those highlighting functions if you want to use them. You will be able to flag questions and bubble them in in the same way as you would on the exam with the tablet format. But on the laptop, you don't have quite all the same functionalities. You know, clicking with the mouse is not the same as using a stylus. Now, is it fair that you have to go out and buy a tablet? Of course not. You could get a Samsung for a couple hundred bucks. It's obviously not ideal to have to shell out for that, but maybe you tell your parents it's for law school and they'll pay for it. Maybe, who knows? But if not a tablet, I think a laptop would be good enough. But it's the question of do you want to do every single thing possible? For some people, it might be overkill. For others, it could be valuable. And I think especially once LSAC releases a bunch more digital format practice tests, that'll be really useful. In the meantime, of course, the Khan Academy ones could be a decent substitute. Yeah, I think this, the Microsoft Surface Go is like 400 something, and the Samsung, one of the Samsungs is around like 250, 230. Just make sure you get the stylus also because that more closely replicates what you'll be doing on test day. The, the stylus for the LSAT is going to have the stylus for the screen on one end and then the, a pen on the other end. I don't know why they're doing a pen because a pencil seems to make more sense for erasing, but you do have a lot of scrap paper, so at least there's that. All right, well, if nothing else, I'm going to wrap up here and thank everyone for coming. There's still the untouched two pies of not raise over there, and I want you all to feel free to dig in.